Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be doing our UFC contrarian betting breakdown for tomorrow, April 6th. Uh, we missed last week. I just uh, was really, really busy, didn't have time to do all the videos. So we're going to get back after it this week. And it's important to note two things, specifically for those of you that have never seen this before. Um, the purpose of doing these videos is, yes, uh, give you some, you know, give me some action. You were going to bet on the fights uh, anyway, but also it's to to train your mind to think about things in a more contrarian way and not to fall into the trap of just following the crowd and following the group think. Um, because, yes, the the following the the sum of the, you know, the smartest people on Twitter and the smartest people in MMA wagering or all wagering it does tend to get you to the most likely result um, and the most likely prediction and the most likely outcome. But when it comes to wagering, it's not that simple because there's, there's prices involved and there's, there's, <laughs> there's big involved and things like that. And usually when you follow the, the, the sum of the, of the information, the sum of the, in, of the intellectual capital, you end up getting to sides that are simply overvalued because everybody is doing the same thing, okay? Um, and what's interesting is when it comes to MMA, it's even more dramatic a phenomenon than with other either sports or other wagering entities, uh, stock market, whatever, because in, in UFC or in MMA, uh, combat sports, what, what happens is, is people analyze and analyze and analyze, and they come up with a at the very best like a binary outcome in other words it's either going to be a in this fashion or b in this fashion and in, in a sport that is rife with chaos that is extremely dangerous uh from a, from a mathematical perspective um usually when when the public arrives at that type of conclusion both of those sides are unbettable uh, both of those sides are just completely overvalued. So what we're going to try to do is identify what the the chalk, I guess, or the most popular analysis is, except the fact that it's probably the most likely analysis, but also conclude that that is also going to be the one you can't bet because it's going to be completely overvalued. And as I mentioned, thinking about betting markets in this way is going to translate not just to MMA wagering, but also to all other forms of wagering. And that's this is the way that I that my brain works with 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 all sports betting, which I really don't do too much anymore. Um, but also with the stock market, which I obviously, you know, been doing for a long time. And anyway, that's the first thing. The, the second thing for those of you that follow my DFS content, it's also important to know that these are completely different analyses to the point where if, if you've watched my DFS bread, bed, uh, my DFS breakdown, you'll see that I come up with completely different ideas when it comes to MMA because the, the, the concept is different. In DFS, you have to sort of presume that the betting markets are at least somewhat efficient, I guess. Um, and then you, you know, you try to get different and you try to get an edge by, by being good with your projections and being good with your lineup constructions presuming that these lines are sort of accurate, but when it comes to, to betting and wagering, the concept is different. You're trying to presume that the lines are not accurate in some way. So what we're doing is coming up with probably some different plays than we would in DFS. And there's going to be one really egregious example of that we'll get to. And I'll go over that actually throughout this video of who I, who I'm going to recommend as far as a bet that I might end up completely fading in, in, in DFS. Anyway, the other reason, by the way, which I do these late is, okay, so a lot of people believe that if you're going to make money betting UFC, that you can't bet into the late lines because they're most efficient. Uh, most people believe that if you're going to bet MMA, you got to try to get CLV by betting early and knowing what you're doing. But for these purposes, it's more important to wait as long as possible because uh, the longer I wait, the better I have a sense for what the public is doing. Um, so it's just a completely different way of, of approaching things. So here we go. 
Uh, let's just start with Melissa Mullins versus Noah Cornole. Um, and Melissa Mullins used to be known as Melissa Dixon. And you have one common theme, and we'll get to another example of it later, where you have a couple of fighters that are coming off this French uh, card, where the perception was that the only reason they were on that card was because it was in France. And whatever their results were, were in, in were were influenced in some way by the fact that they were in France. And this is the first example. So you have Nora Cornole, and she fought a very controversial uh, fight against Jocelyn Edwards, where I think that topology and and you know if you just polled the the general audience, uh, most people believe most people believe that uh, that uh, that Jocelyn Edwards won. Um, but uh, because maybe the, this fight happened to be in France, then Nora Cornoli was the one that got the victory. Um, so there's quite a bit of negative uh, of negative thoughts on, on Cornoli, quite a bit of recency bias, quite a bit of just overall hate. And so as a result, we're just going to have to presume that this line is 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 overly weighted towards the Melissa Mullen side. So we're just going to bet. Uh, Nora Cornoli plus the 275. Now, again, we're not saying that this is particularly a great line because, look, it's still a 70 cent big, but but because we do feel as though there is too much bias against her, we are going to do this. Now, I did forget to go over the rules. Sorry about this. So the rules are, are as follows. Number one, we are going to be betting something each each fight, one thing each fight, and that's not the best money management system in the world, but, but we don't care. Uh, the second thing is that we're going to be betting one unit on every fight, and that is not the best money management system in the world either, but we don't care. The purpose of this video is, is not for that. Um, and for us, one unit is lucky high times 10, 180, and that's, again, I do think it's healthy for, you know, when you're going to be wagering and providing wagering content, and you're actually going to be betting the stuff to announce what your unit means, okay? I know people like to, you know, say I bet one unit, two units, and I see that. I see the, the logic behind that because, listen, people's, you know, bankrolls are different. But I don't know. It seems, I don't know. It just seems a little more healthy for to actually reveal how much you're betting. So we're going to do that. And the other thing is that we like to have some fun with this as well. So for the main event, we are always going to presume that we lose everything else on the card. And as a result, the main event, we are going to attempt to get all of our money back, requiring us on a card like this to get what? 13 to one because they're 13 fights. So we're going to have some fun with that. And we came really close within the last couple of months of getting one of those really big scores in the, in the main event. It was really literally just a click of a button. I was between two different props and I picked one over the other and ah, that would have been, that would have been fun anyway. So we're going to play Nora Cornole and the other things we are going to try to bet these here, but, um, Ooh, but sometimes it won't let me because they don't like zoom too much, but we'll try to get them all in. Uh, if worse, worst case, we will go ahead and do this after uh, after I log off. All right, Dylan Butka versus Cesar Almeida. So this one, this one to me, you hear that? Everything rumbling? What was that? What was that? I don't know. I thought. I thought. One second. Let me just pause your play for a second. Sorry, everybody. We might have had an earthquake here. I'm not sure. Probably not. We'll, we'll update you on that. Anyway, so Dylan Butka versus Cesar Almeida. So Cesar Almeida has this, uh, this one bit of, of, of byline, which is going to make him a little bit too popular, I think. And that is the fact that he beat uh, Alex Perea in a uh, prayer, I guess, in a uh, in a kickboxing match. That was a long time ago. But that has to give him a little bit of a little bit of, of name value here. Um, and Dylan Butka, uh, he is known as not being a very, very good striker. Um, so I have heard some rumblings that perhaps Almeida is going to just have a setup fight. And yet still, Butka is being rated as the favorite. So that to me uh, is, is is pretty telling. And I just think Butka is probably just going to be like a lock here. So we're going to play Butka. And the question is, is whether we're going to play him inside the distance or just the money line. And again, you're, you're even if we, we play a minus 148 favorite, doesn't mean we're not being contrarian, right? 
Um, uh, sometimes favorites are contrarian. I think this is this is one example. We'll get to a couple of others when we get there. But um, the thing is, is that if Budka wins, people are predicting that it's going to be from takedowns and probably a boring decision. So yeah, let's do it. Let's do Budka inside the distance. That should be that could be actually fun. So Budka and by TK or submission plus two fifty for one eighty. Gonna let me do this. Oh my god, I can't believe it's letting me do this. Um okay, moving on. Daniel Argetta versus John Matsumoto. Um, all right. This is going to be one of the I don't know. This is gonna be one of the uh several fights where who I like or who will end up betting in in, in the wagering market is not going to reflect who we're betting in the DFS market. And this is kind of one of them. So Daniel Argetta, I mean, just to spoil it, is a, is a tremendous DFS play. Because if, in fact, he wins, he's going to score quite quite a lot because he's going to be be grappling. However, um, he is starting to become kind of like one of the, you know, the hipster underdog plays of the week. Um, you know, the, he two fights ago, it's not on the board, but he did – pretty much get a submission over, I forget who he was fighting, but they declared it a no contest. And, uh, um, and so, and John Matsumoto is, is not, I don't know, people don't believe that he's good or anything like that. So Argetta is going to be a pretty popular underdog here. So uh, we are going to take Matsumoto here. And again, it's kind of a question of how to play him. So here again, you're, you're expecting Argueta to get that kind of grinding. Uh, I shouldn't say that because he, he should he might be able to get a submission as well. Uh, Matsumoto, uh, they're not really saying one big way that he's going to win. So we're just going to make this kind of awful play of taking Matsumoto and just laying the 162. Um, it's still technically contrarian because... Again, Argetta is, I mean, extremely popular underdog. Very, very few people, and you'll see, taking Matsumoto here. Um, we'll, we'll get to, again, a more egregious example of that a little later, but there you go. All right, moving on. We have Pierre Rodriguez versus Cynthia Calvillo, and they're just going to keep doing it, uh, and we're just going to keep fading it. People continue to try to play Cynthia Calvillo because, as they say, uh, she just has the better level of competition, okay? And it's true. I mean, she fights, she has a, a, a longer history of fighting better competition, but it's certainly getting worse and worse and worse, and she keeps losing and losing and losing. Um, she did, in fact, go ahead and... Uh, hold on one second. So I got to close it. Sorry about that one. It was an earthquake. Oh my God! It is. It is. It is. It is confirmed. Actually, it was an earthquake New sure we in New York. Wow! How about that earthquake in New York? LFG. Anyway, you were there for it. You were there live for the earthquake, and the internet survived. Nonetheless, uh, moving on. Uh, so Cynthia Calvillo just keeps losing and keeps losing and keeps losing, and yet people still keep taking shots at her. And Pierre Rodriguez, in her last fight, she just got subbed by Jillian Robertson. And continuing the, the trend here, we're just going to keep fading this, this, this ultra-popular, for whatever reason, Cynthia Calvilla play. And we'll just take Pierre Rodriguez and just lay the 130. Okay? And just, you know, just nothing, nothing fancy. And there you go. All right, uh, this one, again, this is going to probably come back to get us. We have a couple in a row here, pretty much this whole card. So Pedro Falco versus Victor Hugo. So Victor Hugo was supposed to fight, ah, uh, God, who was he supposed to fight? Well, it's been so long. Oh, uh, hi, uh, Alatang. And he Alatang pulled out, and so they had to replace him, and, and they, there's no way they were going to find someone to replace him with three days' notice, but they did. They found this Pedro Falco guy who was kind of a veteran from the contender series, sort of. And when they announced he was going to replace him, 
I presume that Victor Hugo is going to be some like minus 500 favor or something like that. It's that they love Victor Hugo. They were waiting to get him back into the UFC. And you figure they replace him with someone, you know, that he could probably beat. So they, I expected this line to come out at minus 500 or something like that. Because just because, again, I'm ignorant. I don't know any of these people. But Falco is like my, only like plus 120. I mean, for real? I mean, I, listen, this is this is the way I look at it. I mean, if this is the case where it's supposed to be like an easy fight for Hugo and Pedro comes in at plus 120, he's got to have something. So we're we're going to we're going to take a shot. Uh Pedro Falco plus the 120 for 180. And again, I probably have very little of him in DFS, but uh definitely going to play him here. So here's another one. Here here is here is uh another ultra hipster underdog play. So you have Norma Dumont versus Jermaine Jer 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 Durandamy. And if you look at their 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 histories, Jermaine Durandamy was either was like a former champion who does nothing but fight champions. And she she knocked out uh what's her name? Aspen Land in one round. She submitted Julia Pena, who who's one of the best best around. The, her only two losses, I think, were to Amanda Nunez. And the last time she took her five rounds. And She's coming back. Yes, okay, she's coming back. She's had a pregnancy. She's been off for a couple of years. But she's fighting Norma Dumont, and you're getting Jermaine Durandamy as an underdog? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. That's got to be a lock. So we'll take Norma Dumont. Uh, so the question is, again, whether we play her inside the distance, we play her, uh, whatchamacallit, um, by decision. I, I haven't really seen anybody taking Dumont at all, so I don't know how people are projecting that she's going to win. So we'll just take her and we'll lay the 130. Oops. All right, so here we go. So it's not going to let me anymore. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, okay. Let's move on uh, to the next one, which is... Uh, Court McGee. Versus Alex Morono. So, Court McGee, both these guys are kind of veterans, but Court McGee has fallen on hard times. In, in his last two fights, he's gotten knocked out in the first round. And yeah, he's tough, but as I say, father time is undefeated. So, he's finally come to an end. Um, Alex Morono is just going to outvolume him and just kind of destroy him. Uh, so while people have had some fun playing Court McGee in the past, his last two fights have certainly proven that, that, you know, he, his chin is now probably gone and he's probably on the way out. So we'll take him. Court McGee plus the 240 for 180. All right. Um, moving on, we have Trevor Peak versus Charlie Campbell. This is actually, Trevor Peak is my hero for a lot of reasons. Number one. When he fought Chepe Mariscal in uh, in uh, Jacksonville, that was the actually the live final that I was in for DFS. I was unable to go live. I had to do it for, uh, remotely, but uh, that was a big key fight on the card. And and we took Chepe Mariscal and we won in a brawl. Uh, and 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 you know Mariscal really really put it on him, and he won like a very high scoring decision. And Trevor Peak was essentially, you know, he was everybody's favorite, you know, rumbling, bumbling, stumbling, very aggressive fighter. And he is. I mean, he's just really just incredible cardio. He just very, very aggressive. And that was a great fight. And then this next fight, we had a really big score. We played him over Yaya uh, by decision. What? What? Hello. Oh, sorry about that. And so we played him by decision over Yaya, and we got like a plus five hundred because people didn't think that he could win a decision. So we've been doing very well fading the public with Trevor Peak, and now you have Trevor Peak and Charlie Campbell, and we are everybody's in agreement once again that. This is going to be a war. They're both going to come after it. 
and someone's going to get taken out probably in the first round. So once again, we will just go ahead and do something with the over. Problem is, is that um, I don't think that that's that same juice because I think people, as far as like picking which one, because people have seen Trevor Peak win a decision. They've seen him lose a decision. So we're just going ahead and just take the take the fight either over or goes the distance. So let's take a look at these. All right. Uh, over one and a half is plus 114. That looks pretty easy. On uh, I'm not easy. That looks a little thin. I mean, only plus 114. What about getting to the distance, actually? Um, let's see. Popular round props. To start round one. Why can't I just why can't I just get by decision? What why is this so hard? Popular. Oh, there it is. Uh round method of victory. So go to the distance plus 330. Maybe we we'll just play plus one and a half rounds. Take the 110. This could finish in the third, couldn't it? Well, we'll make well we'll we'll have some fun. We'll go the distance for one eighty or for for plus three thirty. Okay. Um. Moving on, we have uh. Walter Walker, Walter Walker, versus versus Lucas Breski, and uh, Walker is this enormous enormous man. You know, uh, he he can get takedowns. He's Johnny Walker's brother or half brother or brother in law or whatever or half brother I think and and um, you have Lucas Breski who just does nothing but lose and essentially they're throwing him this this Walter Walker guy uh, just so that Walker can get the win and look good and Breski could get you know he'll get cut probably after this fight so we have to take. <laughs> um, Lucas Breski plus why is it only 190 by the way why is it only 190 if this other guy is such a lock we're going to find out Breski plus 190 for 180 okay moving on we have Ignacio Bahamundes versus Christos Yagos so Yagos is definitely has a good first round in him. He's going to come after Bahamundes. He might actually get takedowns, but in the end, uh, Bahamundes is going to to wear him out. And either you know, uh, maybe second or third round KO makes a lot of sense, um, or even a submission. So these are the things you can't bet, right? So what can't you bet? You can't bet Yagos round one because that's his win condition, pretty much. You can't bet Baja Mondays round two, three, because that's like really popular. So what you could do, you could you could play Baja Mondays round one if you want. Or you could play him by decision. Let's take a look at those. I think Baja Mondays round one would be really contrarian. I don't think anybody's expecting that. Let's take a look. All right. So first of all, for first of all, Baja Mondays by decision is plus 250. That's that's not bad. I think that's a little bit better than Baja Monday's round one. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna do that. We'll play Baja Mondays by decision plus the one. Although that's not really on brand now, is it? I mean, which is the more contrarian? Baja Mondays, which is less likely in people's minds to happen? It's gotta be. It's got to be Baja Monday's round one. So we are going to do that. Sorry about that. Baja Monday's round one round props. Oh, it's got to be specific. Ooh, plus 225 only? Ooh, I don't know now. You know that it's not going to be the first minute and a half, two and a half minutes. You only have really two and a half minutes to do this. I think that's cutting things too much. All right, this is this is this is wimpy. 
We're going to do it anyway. Baja Mondays by decision, plus 180. There. I'm telling you, the MMA contrarian guy is going to punish us for, the, for doing this, but we're going to do it anyway. All right, so here is the, uh, this is the one I'm talking about. So Morgan Charrier versus Jose Mariscal. We just referred to Mariscal before. So Morgan Charrier fought on that French, fought on that French card, and he ended up fighting this Italian guy, and he beat him in like a minute and a half. And people are saying it was a complete, I don't want to say fixed fight, but it was, you know, set up for him to win in France. And now he's against Jose Mariscal, and all this guy does is perform. I mean, he, he as I mentioned, he won that incredible fight over Trevor Pete. Then he came back and he beat Jack Jenkins. It was a little controversial. I mean, not really. He lost the first round. Second round, he was doing better. And then he he got uh, he got uh, Jenkins in a submission attempt, sort of, and broke his arm. It wasn't really a straight submission attempt. It just kind of took him down with his arm. So there was an injury that caused that. But he's got a big reputation. I mean, he's being he's very durable, Mariscal. He's fought incredible competition. And this Morgan Sherry is probably a fraud coming over from France. And I'll tell you this. Like Morgan Charrier is minus 122 and Jose Mariscal is getting literally 100% of the recommendations. He's getting recommended in DFS. He's getting recommended in every single betting show in the world. I have all kinds of Mariscal in DFS also. I can't find a soul who's taking Morgan Charrier. Forget the minus 122, even just to win. So I can't help myself. We're we're gonna do it. <laughs> uh Morgan Charrier minus the 122 for 180. All right. Then we have um getting down towards the, the last couple, right? So you have yeah, just two more. Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson. Um unfortunately, you're you're getting some love on both sides of this. You know, you so Alexander Hernandez is definitely, quote, unquote, the better athlete. He also is going to be more aggressive in the first round. So Damon Jackson's path to victory, it is being said, is to survive the first round and maybe take over with some with, 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 his, with his wrestling and his, and his top game and things like that. So, but I am seeing people picking both sides more on the uh, Hernandez side, but not so much that we can consider Damon Jackson contrarian. What we can do is is fade the form of victory so what this means is that we could we if you want to play alexander hernandez you can't play him early because that's the way what people are thinking and if you want to play damon jackson you can't really play him late or by decision specifically because that's what people are thinking so what we can do though is play hernandez by decision i do not think many people are going that way so we're going to do that hernandez by decision plus the one 80. By the way, I, mean, I, I hate to put my take in here, but I will say this. I, I, listen, I promise you, I'm not going to take credit for it. That's not my style. But I just want to show you one line, which I just think is ridiculous. Um, this is my opinion. What do I know? Mariscal, let's go back to that fight for a second. This is, this is why... I'm telling you, this is why the opponent is such a lock. Because even me, I just can't imagine Mariscal losing here. Like, if you play Mariscal inside the distance, you're going to get plus 500. I mean, is that real? I mean, that's got to be an insane bet. It just has to be. Uh, with that said, I mean, there was... Uh, I, I, I announced that some, some play was the best DFS play of the year, I think, two weeks ago, and it lost in fine style. But I I have to tell you this this is a, a crazy Mariscal by submission at plus sixteen hundred is is beyond crazy. I don't know I I I guess I'm missing something and Marish and 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 Sherry is a lock so listen I'll win my one eighty here I'll lose a lot more than DFS I promise you if if Sherry wins anyway um so let us just kind of review I guess uh, our bets. Um, because they're all pretty bad, and that's, that's just the way we like it. We have Cornole. Obviously, she's a fraud. Only reason she won was a fixed fight in France, so we're betting her anyway. Uh, Budka over Almeida. Um, we talked about that. I mean, how is he the favorite when it's supposed to be a setup fight for Almeida? Beats me. 
Uh, our get up hipster dog play of the week of the week number one. We're gonna play the other side. Calvillo, hipster dog play of the week number two. We're gonna play the other side. Victor Hugo in a setup fight. Who the hell is Pedro Falco? Only plus 120. We'll find out as we have him. Jermaine Durandamy, hipster play number five, I guess. Underdog play. We'll take Dumont. Uh Court McGee on his way out. Two straight first round losses. How are we playing him? I don't know. Trevor P. Campbell, how is this thing making the distance? Beats me. We'll find out. Lucas Bresky is going to get cut after he loses. Oh, but what if he doesn't? We have him. Uh, Baja Mondays, this is our win play of the week. Uh, Baja Mondays by decision. I personally think that's the most likely outcome. But what the hell do I know? Uh, Hernandez, Jackson, again, there's no real love for either side. But as far as the, the form of victory goes, I think the Hernandez by decision is the one that's getting overlooked. And so we're going to lose all those. So we're going to lose, what, 12, 13, 12 in a row? So we have to get a 13 to 1 going in this Brandon Allen, Chris Curtis fight. So here's we, here we go. So these guys fought before. And Chris Curtis, you know, pretty close first round. And then he knocked them out. In the, and Curtis knocked him out in the second. Showed a pretty big discrepancy, I think. Well, big enough discrepancy in, in striking, I guess. And since then, the two have gone opposite directions. Well, I shouldn't say opposite. I mean, Curtis has some wins. But he hasn't looked particularly impressive in any of them. Although I should say, I mean, like knocking out Joaquin Buckley is aging pretty well. I have to say that. Um, and all Brandon Allen does is win. I mean, he wins in fine style. Now, he hasn't fought the greatest competition. Like he beat Bruno Silva in the first round. You know, Jocko, not the greatest. Did beat Malcoon somehow? How did he beat that guy? And then he uh he he controlled, I mean, he was throwing an incredibly smart fight against um Muniz and beat him. Then an incredibly smart fight against what's his name? Uh this last fight, uh Paul Craig and beat him. I mean, it's kind of hard to fade Brandon Allen here. So I you can't, I don't know if you could even play anything on the Brandon Allen side. The only thing you could do is if it kind of a, a, a method of victory thing, you know. So, like, what people are suggesting is that if Curtis wins, he's going to either win a striking battle over five rounds or he's going to get a K. Makes sense. And if Allen wins, he's going to get takedowns, maybe Allen by sub. Okay. Um, so if we want to get contrarian, you we have to either, you know, play Allen like by KO somehow, right? Or even Allen by decision, but that's not going to be enough. If not, we're going to have to just, just invent some round. Unless we want to be something really nasty and play like Curtis by submission, which, which we're not going to do. So unfortunately, in this situation, we're going to have to reverse engineer these and start with what's 13 to 1. And see if any of those fit. Oh, here's one other thing you could do. Wow. Well, we're going to get there. I don't know if we can bet 180 on it. But we're, we're, I'm going to take a look. If I can't find anything else, I'm going to do it. Let's first take a look at some of these. Uh, so Brandon Allen by decision plus I mean, none of these are any good. Brandon Allen by KO plus 650 is not the end of the world. But we have to pick an actual round. Yikes. Uh Curtis by submission, that would that would be just legendary. So none of these, none of these like regular things are gonna work. So let's take a look at some of these like these round props. Like we could always take a shot with with Brandon Allen in a, by sub in a particular round, like maybe round four. And that's certainly possible. Um, and I will say that the longer this goes, I think it's the more possible that that. Curtis eventually gives up some takedown and gives up. So I think that you, we could try this. Can't do round three. Why? Because we're not getting 14 to one. So we could try Allen by sub in round four. Or we could play Curtis. Now, this would be pretty legendary, right? So last time these guys fought, Curtis won by KO in round two. So now... For the same thing to happen, you're getting 14 to 1. Now, again, that's not the end of the analysis, but that's pretty cool. 
So those are the two I'd be interested in. So Curtis round two plus 14 to one or Allen by sub in round four, 14 to one. That does take into account their most likely, you know, non, you know, decision win conditions. KO by Curtis and Allen by sub by by round four, uh in round four. But let let me let me let me suggest something else. And I don't know if I'm gonna click this. You're gonna see whether I click it or not. All right. So fight lines, popular. What if? What if the following things happen? Either you get one round where Brandon Allen actually does get the takedown and just is all over Chris Curtis and is threatening the sub and he's pounding away. And for whatever reason, Chris Curtis survives and then wins three other rounds. Or you have Brandon Allen doing really well. He's, you know, keeping him at distance, whatever it is. And then it's three to one. And he's up three to one. And he just needs to stay away from Curtis, but he can't help himself. He wants to go for the finish. Curtis finds a counter early in the round and just basically tees off on Brandon Allen the rest of the round. Just a, just a whole bunch of significant strikes. Or this happens in an earlier round, and they give him a 10-8. What you'll end up getting is a 50-1 to 1 draw. Do we have it in us? Can we do it? I think we can do it. Draw 180. Let's go. All right. That was fun. Uh, good luck today on the good luck tomorrow on the fights. And uh, that'll do it. Good luck.